mankind's cognitive activity, his conscious organization of both the biosphere and lithosphere, the realm of economy, or the noosphere. After absorbing solar radiation, ancient animals such as plankton, algae, and other organisms became layers of decomposing matter at the bottom of ancient lakes. According to Vernadsky, what we know of today as crude oil deposits are extremely condensed forms of solar energy in the form of deceased creatures. Whether the result of processes happening deep within the Earth's mantle, caused by deceased organisms or not, refining and using this in man-made machinery then becomes the most efficient use of this cosmic material. Carbon has long been known to be an abundant element in life on Earth and often takes the form of charcoal. High pressures and heat occurring deep within the Earth's mantle compress carbon, forming the vast diamond deposits in South Africa, Democratic Republic of Congo, and Sierra Leone. Today, this process has been harnessed by man and these very same diamonds can be produced in factories the diamond mining industry can be swept into the dustbin of history. On top of that, so on top of that process of life, you have to add another process of human activity, what Vernadsky called the noosphere, which can now concentrate things and create types of structures and organization that life itself could never get, that life on its own could never, could never attain. The noosphere's increasing domination over living matter in the biosphere through agriculture, industry, and science is now becoming the commonplace activity of the universe. Contrary to globalization, which seeks to devalue the cost of labor to save some money, society's mission must be to drastically increase the physical cost of living of individuals. This includes increasing the physical cost of production through capital investments in infrastructure and agriculture per capita and per square kilometer. Surplus can be invested into new technological and scientific research, allowing for better efficiencies in future production. When using cheap, poorly skilled labor to mine ore to be refined in another nation abroad, society as a whole loses through the social equivalent of heat loss. Shipping goods with the highest physical value, the highest technological input, is the only feasible economic approach. This means a near-future goal of world trade with finished and semi-finished goods only, and eventually, high technology goods. This requires the development of the productive powers of labor in countries which today make use of crude forms of human labor such as alluvial diamond mining and gold mining in Sierra Leone or the Democratic Republic of Congo. The skill level of the worker must be upgraded with the introduction of new technologies which allows them to accomplish far more work at a fraction of the man hours. Massively upgrading infrastructure for the population as a whole as well as near the region of the mining will require higher energy flux density electricity generation, more power produced per unit area. Atomic power, including advances in thermonuclear fusion, is the only way to go. Uses for nuclear isotopes are potentially infinite and have already been put to use in new medical technologies, advances in agriculture, bacterial sterilization for food preservation, and a myriad of other techniques. Changing the genetic structure of plants through nuclear irradiation has already made them more climate durable and nutritious. This allows for better quality and higher yield crops of wheat in Kenya, sesame in Egypt, cassava in Ghana, and banana in Sudan. Currently, Kenya imports two-thirds of its wheat, its second most important cereal crop. The genocidal decision to ban DDT, a completely safe insecticide, has caused the infection of 500 million and death of 1 million individuals annually from malaria. A child dies from this disease every 30 seconds in sub-Saharan Africa. 
with the immediate reinstatement of sector-by-sector -sector DDT spraying or through new advances in sterilization techniques of harmful insect populations via nuclear irradiation, we could defeat malaria. Use of electromagnetic phenomena has been shown to effectively defeat locust populations that decimate the agriculture of the African farmer. We found some very fat locust type grasshoppers. And we demonstrated that with electronic warfare, we could kill these grasshoppers in great hordes. So we said, if there's no problem with the grasshoppers in Africa, we could put these electronic devices in aircraft, fly over the area where the locusts are swarming, and we could turn these locusts into fertilizer. But looking at all the, uh, the electromagnetic phenomena, the electromagnetic properties of insects, the electromagnetic properties of, uh, of larger organisms, electromagnetic properties of disease agents such as viruses, bacteria, I mean that's almost completely untapped or very little tapped. And I think the, the mastery of that is going to completely change our interaction with all of those things here on Earth. It is known to some researchers that solving retroviruses involves mastery over the electromagnetic spectrum. Investigations into technologies which allow man to increasingly control electromagnetic phenomena are also indispensable in the fight against HIV and other degenerative cellular disorders. Decoding the mysteries of the living cell and its electromagnetic mitosis provides a research pathway for freedom from HIV, cancers, and other diseases which today plague the world. Further research into radiation, the electromagnetic spectrum, molecular biophysics, and the modification of living systems is imperative. Who is to say that the breakthrough in these investigations is not going to come from an individual born in Africa or Southeast Asia? We are reaching the age where the noosphere, man's creative power, is increasingly becoming the dominant force in the universe. Man's mastery over the elements of the periodic table, their employment for the benefit of man, is becoming a reality. This increased knowledge threatens the existence of the entire framework of imperialism. So in order to help ourselves, we must integrate Africa first. We must have infrastructure. Uh, Africa has to go through its own industrial revolution. In terms of raw material reserves for the planet, Africa has the most. When it comes to Africa, the plans already exist for greening the deserts, for expanding waterways, for building rail links and ports, for power, for new agricultural regions, and the development of new cities. The Trans-Aqua Plan, first developed in 1988 by the Italian consulting firm Bonifica, would divert 5% of water flow from the Congo River upward. Diverted water then flows into the depleted Chad Basin at the same rate as the water at the Aswan Dam in Egypt, creating irrigated lands along the way. Development along the Nile River is long overdue. The construction of the Meroe Dam in Sudan represents mankind willfully transcending the biosphere with the noosphere. When completed, it will produce 50% of the nation's electricity capacity and transform a relatively small agrarian and herding population of 60,000 into an agricultural region suitable for 4 million inhabitants. This includes the construction of modern residences with paved roads, electricity, running water, sewage systems, modern educational systems, and health care centers. The nation's largest airport is constructed nearby. It is potentially a major hub for international flights connecting Europe and the Middle East to Africa and the rest of the world. And uh, with China, we have been able now to build the largest dam. That dam is made particularly so that it can provide irrigation for most of the northern arid land, you know, we will be successful. There will be thousands and thousands of acres of, uh, of uh, wheat 
uh, fruit 